Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. The Human Experience Podcast is plunging back through the world of transpersonal psychology, mystical experiences, and the use of psychedelics as healing tools. My guest tonight is Dr. James Fadiman, who is the author of the book Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. He also helped found the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. Jim, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. So let's just start this with a big disclaimer that we don't advocate the use of drugs or illegal behavior and the use of these compounds should be regarded as highly sacred. <laughs> Sounds, I'll go for that disclaimer. <laughs> okay. So Jim, you're highly educated. If you could just detail that for our listening audience to begin this conversation, I think that would be helpful to credential what we're discussing. Sure, sure. My, my credentials are that I was a Harvard undergraduate and uh, my favorite professor turned out to be someone named Richard Alpert, who later became Ram Dass. And I was, after college, I was actually living in Europe and trying to stay there as long as possible. And my draft board wrote and said, would you like to join us in Vietnam, or have you considered graduate school? So I went to graduate school at Stanford and did a dissertation about the effectiveness of psychedelic therapy. Um, then I have had a very checkered career since then, since I was told that if I did a dissertation on psychedelic therapy, I would never have a normal academic career, mm. and so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, your book was very intriguing, and there's a part in it, and the year is 1961, you're mm -hmm. in the city of Paris, Right. And you're sitting next to Richard Alpert, a.k.a. Ram Dass, the highly revered Ram Dass. And you're under the influence of mushrooms. Yeah. So how did, how did that take place and what was happening? <laughs> well, I was living in Paris and I was completing a remarkably bad novel, which I thought was a remarkably good novel. <laughs> and my professor, Richard Alpert, passed through Paris on his way to Copenhagen, where he would meet with... Timothy Leary and Aldous Huxley, and they would be presenting for the first time some of the Harvard research at an international psychological conference. And so Richard, who really had, I'd become really a good friend, um, said to me, the greatest thing in the world has happened to me, and I want to share it with you. And that sounded pretty good. <laughs> then he reached into his jacket pocket and came out with a little vial of pills. And I was taken aback, because I didn't drink coffee. I mean, I was really beyond straight. Yeah. And I looked at the pills, and I thought words that we can't say on radio. And, and he, then I took them. And we sat on a little cafe on the sidewalk in Paris. And gradually, uh, things began to feel very bright and very colorful. And the noise was a little loud, and in fact... I could much more easily hear the conversations of the people behind me um, and understand what they were saying. And I realized my French wasn't that good, <laughs> that I could actually do that. So I said to Richard, this is too much for me. And he said, it's actually too much for me, too. Uh, he had not taken anything. He said, because this is the first time I've been in Paris. <laughs> so we retreated to my fifth floor walk-up, and I had a... Uh, a series of kind of revelations about the way the world was put together and who I was and what relationships were like, that was very meaningful. Hmm. And a week later, I followed Ram Dass to Copenhagen and had another experience. Now, this, in retrospect, would be a moderate dose of psilocybin. Um, and it was, in those days, they were looking at what they would call profound human closeness. Mm-hmm. Um, nothing really mystical. 
And so uh, life went on, and I ended up at Stanford and met with a group who were working with LSD there and um, took a, a much deeper plunge into psychedelic uh, expansion of reality. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. So that would you say that that was how your interest in psychedelics began? Yeah, I had zero interest, zero knowledge, zero experience, and the whole world of altered states really didn't exist. Um, certainly, for people like me. Hmm. So you were so, as well, straight so, as so you were LSD straight edge. Has been around. I'm, hmm? You were straight edge. You were a st- yeah. You... I was. I was a kind of neurotic intellectual, such as Harvard could very easily produce, and I was very um, aware that being intelligent was probably the only uh, really interesting value. So, how would you say? How would you say that that experience changed you? <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I just said, I think, is nonsense about the way human beings are, <laughs> um, which is it alerted me to, to, at the first level, I found that, being, that other people really mattered and that uh, my being kind of smart and arrogant mainly kept me away from people. And then when I later had LSD, I became aware that I was part of a much larger reality uh, of which Jim Fadiman was a very small part and of which the personality of Jim Fadiman was an even a smaller part. So that my entire world view uh, was not changed, it was simply expanded. Yeah. So that I now lived in a much larger world in which the natural world, uh, that I was part of it, I was not separate from it, and that intellect was a tool, nothing more than that. Um, and there was a great deal that I now was open to that I had no had no awareness of before and no understanding. Was there, was there one particular vision or experience that stands out in your own mind that kind of affected your view on reality specifically? Yeah, let me, what comes to mind is, is a moment during that first LSD experience, which was much uh, higher dose, and I was in a different setting, um, in a safe, what we now would call a safe setting with... Uh, eye shades and music, and I had, uh, in the great darkness of the universe, there was a tiny light, and I found myself flying towards that light, and that light seemed to be incredibly loving, and then in front of me was Jesus, Hmm. and I was probably a disinterested agnostic with no religious, particular religious experience, (laughs) and I found that kind of strange, but I was clearly in a strange universe, and then I flew past it, and I looked back, and I could see that the Jesus was like a uh, a stage setting, you know, where you build a stage set from the back, and you can see the framing in the back, mm-hmm. and and then I turned back towards this light, and flew towards it, and it had um, it had no dimension, and it had no theology, and in retrospect, I can see that the great religious saints of all the traditions, in a sense, are standing in front of the light. So the light seems to come from them, but it's really coming through them. And that was a major shift for me. Um, Even though the the next day I was still a graduate student in psychology at Stanford, um, and no one else in the department had much interest in my worldview one way or another. In your book you talk about this first, second, and third wave. I mean, are we, are we still within this third wave of explorers and researchers? Well, if, if I'm a member of the third wave, probably there's a fourth and fifth wave. Right. As I'm uh, now finding that um, there's, a, there's a list, a graduate student list, um, that you have to be a graduate student of some sort and, and overtly have... A, have been exploring psychedelics through courses, through research, and you can join that list. And there's maybe 800 people on that list. And they're from all over the world and from a dozen disciplines. And so we're really seeing the, the kind of expansion of, of that it's okay to be deeply interested in these substances and what they do, 
and still be part of the uh, dominant scientific culture. So this is very much not um, kind of hippies in New Mexico in a commune, which I've already, which I also did, but really that the culture is now loosening up enough to accept that there is a proliferation of people with psychedelic interests, um, of which your podcast is, is just another example. I mean, the 60s must have been such an interesting time. Even now, I mean, if you, as you look at the shift and the people who are kind of waking up to how therapeutic this can be and how these compounds can really affect and change your lives for the better, it really makes you wonder where we will be in 10 years, 20 years. Well, the 60s had one major difference, which is we saw that since we represented truth, life, goodness, love, health, food, etc., <laughs> that it was only a matter of time before the world immediately caught on to what we were doing and stopped doing things that were bad for the world. Now, it's very hard to be optimistic about the future in the large sense. And the psychedelics are more like trying to save us from the overwhelming kind of forces of, you know, inequality and climate change. Um, so there's a braver kind of new generation coming up. But fortunately, there's a lot of them, and when they hold hands, they form a big group. The heart of the Occupy movement, there were lots and lots of people with serious psychedelic experience, for example. I really feel like your book is kind of the first of its its kind in that, I mean, outside of groups like Arrowhead, I mean, you don't right. really see people writing about, and at the sake of their careers, they're afraid to really talk about this. And, and your book writes down how to prepare yourself and how to guide someone who is in the midst of this bending experience. I mean, it can well, really the, change you. Well, the thing that, that people forget in the research world is everybody else. And so if I'm talking to a group of four or 500 people, and I'll say, how many of you are going to be in a research study with a psychedelic next year? And maybe one hand will go up. And I say, how many of you are going to use the psychedelic next year? <laughs> and, you know, 400 hands go up. So my book is written for the 400, which says if you're going to use psychedelics, probably, given how powerful they are and how valuable and how important, you'd probably like to do it with maximum benefit and minimum risk. And so the first few chapters of the book are entirely that. Um, and that was really the, my impetus for the whole thing, which was what would be helpful if we're going to do it anyway. You know, it's, it's funny because, and going back to the risk of, you know, your career by talking about this, and I'll, you know, as, as I'm running this podcast and I'm, I'm <laughs> inviting people to be on the show, and if you look at my previous guests and, you know, some people will reply and they're just like, no, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, the vibe that I get is, well, you know, I, I just, I don't want to, at the risk of my career, be well, on also, your podcast. Also, in a, in a kinder way, um, a number of the people who are doing research, who you've probably asked, um, they are being, um, they need federal approval, they need state approval, they need university approval, they need department approval. There's something called an IRB, an Institutional Review Board, that universities have to look at all research. So there's an awful lot of people that are giving them permission who are a little nervous. Hmm. So they don't want to go onto a show like yours and talk much beyond what their research is because they don't want their research to be stopped right. by, by one frightened alumnus you know, who phones the university and says, I gave you half a football stadium, now you're going to use these dreadful drugs, I don't want to give you any more money. <laughs> yeah, that definitely so, puts so it. So in a real sense, they're not frightened, but they are still dealing with a bureaucracy that has not caught up with the culture. I think that you can see it so easily with marijuana research, which is, it's obvious that marijuana has a lot of benefits, but it's very hard for the government to say, well, 
if that's true, we have to reschedule it. And if we reschedule it, we have to admit we've been wrong for, you know, decades. Yeah. And that's hard. Yeah. I'm not affiliated, you know, in a formal way. I am part of um, the university I helped found, but at the moment I, I'm not teaching there. Mm-hmm. And uh, my own research, um, while I couldn't get it approved in a university, because I'm not actually giving anyone any drugs. I'm asking a lot of people how they're using them in very specific ways. Um, but I understand very much people being a little nervous to be on on wide open shows like yours. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's the human experience. I like to cover a range of subjects. And, right. you know, we've had a scientist from CERN on. So, and I and I really feel like these these medicines, I'd like to call them that, um, can really open doors to your psyche and help you, help people with their traumas. But moving on here, um, is, there, is there a hero for you in the field of psychedelics? Oh, my. I think I look up to some of my younger friends. Um, I think my, probably my main hero would be like Alicia Danforth, who is doing the breakthrough research uh, with Charlie Grove, and they're working with people with high-functioning autistic, uh, which was Asperger's. And it turns out that um, using psychedelics, or MDMA, mm-hmm. um, and MDMA in particular in this case, um, they can much more easily learn to be more sociable and basically have a much richer personal life. And Alicia is my hero because she worked at the edge of the field decided that she wanted to be a clinician working with people, went back to school, got a Ph.D., and a brilliant one, and then basically, um, with Charlie, said to the government, we want to do a research project for people who are not mentally ill. And that's a whole breakthrough. Um, Roland Griffiths at, at John Hopkins is another hero, He's a uh, very, very distinguished, full professor, um, long background in the addiction field. And he, again, took the, the risk of both his career, his reputation, and his, his job uh, to set up a series of research projects that have um, really opened uh, psychedelics once again to, um, to researchers and to physicians and to uh, potential patients. And the other thing that, that Roland did is he also did a study on do these substances uh, encourage spiritual experience. Now, that may seem like a no-brainer to your audience, but what he was doing was making a critical breakthrough for the federal government, which is the federal government says, and I think they're correct, we should regulate stuff that goes into your body. That should be one of the functions of government, and um, we don't want poisoned food, we don't want, uh, you know, medications that don't hold the medication, etc. So we really do want a Food and Drug Administration. On the other hand, we also want the government to stay out of our spiritual life, and the Constitution really does say church and state are separate. So what do you do when you have a substance which goes into your body, but it's for spiritual purposes? Uh, The government really, you know, they'd rather that would just go away. But Roland really worked it through so that the government said, okay, um, you can do it. And the fact that it worked wonderfully and people had beautiful experiences, um, again, opened, opened it back up again to a whole generation of people that that didn't know anything about it. I like that your heroes are all living and alive. But um, you know, I think it was I think it was Rick Doblin who said that the most important thing that we can do is t- talk openly about these experiences, and I I agree. Yeah, well, that's see, that's the nice thing is I'm able to do that again because um, I'm not involved in any institution that would be upset at my doing it. So, getting back to your book here, why is it so important that we have a guide while we're going through these sacred journeys? Well, it, it, basically, a guide, and it's a little too strong a word, but I don't have a weaker one, a guide is there if you need help. 
And also a guide is there so that you can go as far as you wish, knowing that you will be safe. It's a little bit like a safari guide, where a safari guide doesn't interfere with your experience, but he may say, I would um, walk to the, to the left of that path, because that little clear patch ahead is something in our language translates as quicksand. Or, why don't you stand behind the tree, because this animal running towards us um, actually doesn't like us. And if you have no experience, you you could make some serious mistakes. And so a guide allows you to go farther and go deeper, knowing that if you get in trouble, you just like wag your finger or say, can I talk to you? Um, and they will, they will help. So for instance, a very common experience for people having a mystical experience, a feeling of, of total unity, before they get that, they often have an experience which, which seems to be like dying. And if they look at the guide and they say, I feel I'm dying. And obviously they're saying this frightened. And the guide says, oh, that's great. Go with it. Suddenly you realize, well, the guide seems to know something you don't. You trust the guide. He cares for you. Um, it's going to work out. And so a guide can be very, very helpful when you basically get into areas where you don't know what you're doing. Hmm. Yeah, I would have to agree completely. I, yeah. I, I don't think that, I mean, but it's hard because, I mean, you, when you look at a person who is inclined to use these substances, they're not thinking about that. I mean, they're not thinking about kind of calling one of their friends and inviting them over while, you know, they, right. they trip on acid. So, well, they, I'm, you know, I know I come on as some kind of right winger in this way, but it's, um, Certain things are better with a guide. Certain things are better with another person. You know, I know people who do sex alone. But honestly, it's really better with someone else. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and, and I'm, I'm not trivializing it. It's that, um, that if you're serious, then you want to do it well. If you simply want to tr- groove out and watch the ceiling undulate and hear fantastic music... Take less, and probably you won't get into trouble. And if you do, um, I hope there's somebody nearby. But sometimes very, very, very sophisticated uh, psychonauts can suddenly get in trouble. Why, why do that if you, if you can possibly avoid it? And again, a guide isn't a heavy thing. They, they're around. They don't have to be with you. Mm-hmm. The next room is fine. That might the, be that might be a yeah. new employment opportunity. Is <laughs> that's for sure hiring? Well, there people. there are people um, who can't wait for these drugs to be legal to help people who have mental difficulties, and so there are underground guides. It, it does exist, and I know one group where the training takes three years. Hmm. So they're taking it very seriously, and of course they're also risking um, all kinds of things by offering this kind of help. Yeah. Wow. And do you think that this idea of having a guide is a sort of remedy for our own culture's lack of context for the use of psychedelics uh, as compared to maybe the ceremonies of these indigenous tribes or Yeah. Well, these other if we people? look at the at the rituals that have come from everywhere from ancient Greece to, you know, to Peru, they're not nobody's alone. And they have a guide. They may call him a curandero, an os- you know, uh, a vegetista, a, a shaman, a priest. Um, even in meditation, people talk about meditation teachers or, you know, going to the zendo where you're meditating and there's somebody there. It uh, doesn't mean you can't meditate on your own, but there seems to be an inherent advantage on having somebody who's, who knows more than you do. Um, and I don't, I don't, you know, it seems to me pretty obvious. I'm not saying that people can't do things alone, um, but I do know, you know, I do know the advantages of somebody else. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, I mean, I, you get into, in your book, you get into the various kind of dose frequencies or the dose levels right. and how some doses can be 
sort of mystical experiences and low dosages can sort of aid cognitive functions. Right. What what benefits do you think these low doses of psychedelics can bring? And what have you noticed well, in your research? Well, let, let me go kind of down the doses fairly quickly, and I'll use LSD as a model because that's probably best known, which is around 400 micrograms is the area in which mystical experience is most likely to happen with a guide. If you go into 200, um, that's a kind of psychotherapeutic benefit where you can save yourself an awful lot of hours of therapy and do very intense personal work. But you're not losing, you're not going beyond your personality as you would in the higher dose. When you get down to around 100 micrograms, you can use that for highly technical, personal, you know, professional problem solving of a, of a very ordinary nature in physics, architect. And then um, around 50 micrograms is what we would now call a concert dose. Uh, it says something about the culture change. It used to be called, by the way, a museum dose. And that's where you are having a wonderful time tripping, but you're not going, uh, you're not going to have much insight or difficulty. Uh, and you should have, if not a guide, at least a designated driver uh, to get people home from, say, a concert. At 10 micrograms, which is a microdose, that's a, that's a whole new area that we're just exploring where things you just seem to function a little better. You're a little healthier, a little kinder. You can be creative a little longer. Um, and so that's like improved functioning um, without any of the... Uh, without any of the visual excitement. So that's a, that's a quick run through the doses. Now, mm -hmm. did, I, did I get your question along the line? Yeah, a bit, but I'd like to get into it a bit more. I mean, I think it was, I think it was Francis Crick who yep. uh, discovered the, the double helix in DNA, and he later admitted that he was low-dosing LSD with him and his friends at uh, Cambridge. Right. I mean, how can, we, how can we use this to help us every day? Well, um, he was dosing with his friends in Cambridge actually after that time in his life. And although my book gives him, gives psychedelics credit for the double helix, I've been chastised by some of my other research friends who say that only appeared in one newspaper article and it was never verified and his mm. best friends say he didn't take LSD until later. So let's put... However, the question of how can you use it, and, and when they were taking LSD in Cambridge, that was definitely not a daily event, and they weren't working on science, I don't think, much during that time. Um, for daily use, and again, uh, you can't take psychedelics daily. Uh, they're what uh, uh, Albert Hoffman, the, the developer of LSD, said they have anti-addicting properties. They're a peculiar class of substances where if you take 100 mics on Monday, you'll have a certain effect. If you take 100 mics on Tuesday, you'll have much less effect. Mm -hmm. And if you take it on Wednesday, nothing happens. Now, that isn't necessarily physiological, but it's as if your system says, I don't need any more of whatever that is for a while, and I, and I, will, not, um, I will not make use of it if you put it in my system. So even with microdoses, taking them once every third day, is more effective than taking them every second day or every day. I mean, you mentioned that psychedelics, like any other drug, may not be for everyone. And, I mean... Definitely, definitely. There are variations in body chemistry. How, how do we acknowledge that, and how do we reference that? Well, one way is when people say to me, and they often do, you know, I'd really like to take LSD, but... And I say, don't take it. And they say, well, wait, wait, I haven't told you my reason. I said, any reason is a good reason from my point of view. If it feels like it's not a good idea, don't do it. That's one group. Then people who, again, the reason why you have a guide is people who have a very fragile ego structure um, may get in trouble if they take a psychedelic. It's not for them. So this is this is... It's a little bit like uh, flying a private plane. Anyone can learn to do it, but for some people, they'll always be anxious and nervous and it'd be uncomfortable, and it's no fun, and why should they do that? So I'm very much not, let's put it in the drinking water. I am saying, and I think Shulgin says it, is know what you're taking and know who you are, and that will be the best information you can get. 
So if it feels like this is not a good idea, don't do it. Um, and when I've asked hundreds of people, have you ever taken psychedelics for social pressure? The answer is almost never. So people do seem to have a fairly good idea of that it's, when it's not a good idea. And if they have it once and they have a very bad experience, that's probably a hint that it's either the wrong um, substance for them or it's the wrong time in their life. It's like an internal compass. It kind of points, and when you're not meant to do it, it kind of just goes the other way, and it, it really well, fits strongly. I mean, sometimes people, you know, people, if it's possible for people to screw up, somebody will. And the thing that's amazing is given that 20... Five million people have taken LSD, just LSD, since it became illegal. Incredibly few of them have had really serious problems. And some have had very serious problems. I'm just talking with some people now, and a friend of his took six hits of LSD, probably LSD, and had a terrible experience, and no no guide, uh, nobody knew anything. Um, and it's now about six or seven weeks later, and he's still very paranoid and very unhappy. Um, His parents tried to hospitalize him, but the hospital terrified not only the young man, but his parents, and they pulled him out. So there are problems. People can get into trouble. Yeah. And they mainly get into trouble by taking too much, taking something they don't know what it is, and again, not having anyone around to help. I mean, let's let's dig into that a little bit more. Have you personally ever had a negative experience, bad experience? Um, I've had a yeah, I'd say I've had a negative experience, um, but I was aware that it was a negative experience, meaning I didn't get caught in it. Can you um, share? What, and what was uh, it? it uh, well, it, it, you know, I don't remember much of it, but it wasn't very interesting, and I was kind of suffering uh, whatever I was suffering, and my wife. Uh, who had also taken a, a psychedelic, came over to me and I said, um, don't worry, I'll be better. Just take care of yourself. And she went out and had a wonderful, wonderful experience and came back a few hours later. And it's like when you've eaten something and then you have uh, food poisoning. If you know it's food poisoning, awful, but it's not scary. If you don't know, you know, if you didn't know that you ate anything, and you had no idea what was going on, and you didn't know whether it was something much more serious, than, and there was no one to talk to. That's very different. So again, how a, uh, um, the people at Burning Man are very good about this, because they work with people that have all un- unbelievably awful trips. But when they get into the hands of the Burning Man um, helper staff, what people say is we don't ever bring anyone down, we bring them through, mm-hmm. which is we take where they are in the bad trip and we begin to guide them back towards their own center. And everyone's center is, is intrinsically healthy, including if you're very, very mentally disturbed, your center is still healthy. Um, I remember a friend of mine once who phoned me and she was very frightened. She was very against going to physicians. And she was hemorrhaging very badly. Mm. And she was very frightened. And then in the middle of it, as she was kind of weeping and screaming, uh, she came in a little different voice and said, don't worry, I'll be all right. And I realized that was a different part of her who understood that she was hemorrhaging, but it wasn't really that dangerous, and so forth. And there was a part of her that was totally calm, totally clear, and totally... Uh, able to function if necessary. You know, I think if we moved more into this decriminalization, it, this would le- be less common. I think it would be I mean, yeah. just the paranoia around acquiring these substances and, and doing them because they're illegal. That alone is scary enough to not want to do them. And yeah. I think that's well, a big that, part of it. It being illegal is a bad part of set and setting. And being unsure of what you've gotten is a bad part of set and setting. And there's some really bad stuff out there that's sold as other stuff. Um, there's a whole collection of things called N-bombs, mm. which um, are often sold as LSD, but the, 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 the dose that will get you in serious trouble is only two or three times the dose 
that people like. With LSD, let's say you, for most people, this if you take a, a, a big amount, usually you'll, you'll just have, um, you'll be knocked out, you might still be fine. So the young man I spoke of earlier, I don't know that he took LSD. He might have taken something, uh, one of the end bombs, and got in trouble. Mm-hmm. So obviously, it's like in Prohibition. In Prohibition, there was, there was called, there was, you know, you could get very good, well-distilled spirits that were good for you, or had nothing else in them but, you know, but alcohol and flavoring. Or you could get um, things that were very bad for you and dangerous and would kill you. Yeah. Because um, that which is illegal cannot be regulated, cannot be measured, cannot be, you know, doled out. It's like if you go to a marijuana dispensary, you pretty well know what you're being given these days because we are regulating it. It's interesting that these substances affect not only the mind, but the spirit as well. And a big thread through your writings is the concept of how humans are connected and woven right. into this sort of existence of everything around them. How do you think that plays into all of this? Well, to me, it's the fundamental realization that, um, that you cannot be separate. And once you have it, it's pretty obvious. I mean, here I'm standing on a rug that's on some wood that connects to the earth um, through a foundation. Um, I don't think that way, but, but I, it's true. I'm actually being held up by a whole lot of, of things that I've had nothing to do with, but they're part of my system. So that there, the, the implication of using psychedelic and what I've seen is uh, people who just take concert doses, what they tell me is eventually, they say, eventually, you know, I, I realize I'm just not as neurotic. I'm not as frightened of people. I'm, I'm easier to be with. And I really am liking nature more. And so I'm seeing this as a kind of natural progression, just as the notion is um, that if you go to a university and you take a liberal arts degree, you know, you develop a certain awareness of other parts of the world and other parts of your culture. So that psychedelics seem to be a very useful tool for reconnecting us to the natural world, which we obviously have to be a part of. I think it was Albert Hoffman who said his last piece of advice was, you know, take, take LSD in nature if you're going to take it. Exactly. And that's because he always, the uh, last few decades of his life, whenever he took a microdose, he said, I'd usually do it when he's walking in trees. That worked for him. We're approaching the end. What, I mean, what do you think needs to be done within society that can improve, you know, how we perceive these compounds? And, and so we're not putting people's careers at risk by discussing them. Well, what's happening is the culture is moving in the direction of allowing people to explore their own inner nature. Again, we had this strange legislative clamp on everybody's mind, but it didn't work. You know, when I say 25 million people have taken LSD since it became illegal, if I throw in marijuana, the figure goes up to 140 million. That's just in the U.S. So that we've been um, comfortable with, with, with working illegally, actually, for a very long time. And I now meet people who've you know, grown up or entire lifetime, um, their psychedelic use has been illegal, and they just say that's the way it is. And the other thing we're getting is generational psychedelic use. Um, I was uh, talking to a group of about 300 students at UC Santa Cruz, and I often do kind of research by saying, you know, raise your hands. And I all of a sudden wondered how many of them had parents who would use psychedelics. And so I asked that question, and about 85% of them had parents who used psychedelics. So we're talking about the real culture is quite riddled with people with psychedelic experiences. Um, and that percentage gets smaller when you go to regulators, and then probably the, the group with the least psychedelic experience as a group are probably legislators. And I'm sure there's some wonderful reason for that, but I, I don't know it. It reminds me of a funny story. I was uh, I was cooking some marijuana brownies and had them out on the table. Didn't expect anyone to come over, and my mom stopped by and 
she <laughs> she saw them and she she uh she decided to sample some <laughs> and needless to say that was an interesting day <laughs> Well, see, that's, you know, those are the new problems we have. <laughs> and, of course, with one, one of the things we're learning with marijuana is that eating marijuana is not the same as smoking marijuana. Yeah. Um, and so people are overdosing on edibles, let alone their mothers. Um, <laughs> uh, because, again, because it's a little hard to get the, the, the rules of the road out there. Yeah. And unless you're in Colorado. And, and, but but if you, here, here's the thing that blew me away. Um, I got a, a, a note on my email that said, wow, Time Magazine. So Time Magazine on the cover has, um, uh, the cover article is about marijuana science. And I'm, I'm fairly blown away. And then National Geographic comes in. And on the cover of National Geographic, is their feature article is about what they call weed science. Mm-hmm. And then I also get Science News, which is a digest of, of hard science in, in a dozen fields, kind of popularized, but, but it's a, a, not, a, not a big magazine, like 20, 30 pages. And its cover is about designer drugs, about the various kinds of, of offshoots or, or off kind of variations on psychedelics. And I think the culture is really moving fast here. Um, we really better get the legislators on board before they really, uh, you know, are are left behind in the um, acceptance of these substances in healthy ways. One of the healthy ways, of course, is called pleasure. Uh, and there was an editorial in the Stanford Daily that says it should not be a crime to enjoy pleasure. Yeah. Well, Jim, it's it's been a pleasure, man. You are a really interesting person. I really appreciate your time. Um, where can people find your work and buy your book? Well, they can buy my book any place, you know, um, online or in bookstores. But probably better online. And I know, uh, you know, Amazon and and Barnes and Noble and so forth. Um, and reaching me, um, if you want to. Uh, if you want to hear a lot more my carrying on about various things, um, <laughs> jamesfadderman.com has a whole stack of both videos and audios. And uh, I'm, a James, I'm a J. Fadderman at Gmail. Um, if people want to reach me, and I generally answer things eventually. Ooh, putting your email out there. Okay, I respect well, that. Well, it's, it's, I do that mainly because people who are interested in microdosing uh, sometimes write and say, "Do you have a? Do you recommend a way of doing it?" Uh, sometimes people write me and say, "Hi, I'd like to do microdosing. Please send me illegal drugs in the mail." <laughs> oh, gosh. And I, I write back. They don't say illegal drugs. They just say, you know. <laughs> and I say, you know, in a sense, it's sweet because they're they're growing up and they're not worrying about it. And I write them back that I say, I actually, particularly since I've written the book, I really don't do anything illegal. Uh, especially that, <laughs> and it is it is one of the the, the uh, pains one has when we, when one becomes a somewhat public figure, is that I'm really, um, you know, straighter than so many of my straighter as a drug user than my friends these days, um, but but we all make sacrifices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, want to know if your mom eventually felt that that was okay oh yeah she loved it and uh my dad was not happy but yeah well he didn't get it (laughs) that's probably why he wasn't happy (laughs) all right well it's been awfully good talking to you too thank you so much sir uh this is the human experience we're going to get out of here with my guest it was a pleasure having you on sir thank you so much and we will see you guys next week okay thanks a lot